Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to go into more detail about uh, the testing that I did uh, in order to see what the performance of the M1-based Max is really like, and especially in terms of a video production workflow. So I did quite a bit of testing with video rendering, and I also tried some stuff with uh, doing some live streaming and also hardware compatibility. So I'm going to go over in a lot more detail in this video. And if you haven't seen my other video that I just released as well, you can go back and watch that. It's kind of a high-level summary. Uh, this video is meant to be a much deeper dive into that data. So this is an Excel spreadsheet that I've put together with uh, all the data that I've collected. I spent over 200 hours rendering videos in uh, Premiere Pro, uh, Final Cut, and Resolve and compiled the results here and did that across nine different computers. And those nine computers, starting up here at the top, an AMD Ryzen 9 3950X with a, with a RTX 2080. That's my daily driver. That's the computer I use most of the time. That machine has 64 gig of RAM. The GPU has 8 gig of memory. Uh, this particular one is the only one in the, in the batch where the, all the footage came off of a hard drive. And all the rest of them I use SSDs. But yeah, so that machine cost about 2200 to build. Uh, so definitely more expensive than the Mac. The next one, the Ryzen 5 3600. Again, this is a computer that I have here in my trailer. Uh, it has an RTX 2060 graphics card, uh, 64 gig of RAM, 6 gig on the graphics card, and used the NVMe SSD. And Intel i5 8600, this is a computer I used to have here in the trailer, and that one's running a, a, a GTX 1050 Ti on the graphics card, but I also have a 1650, so I ran it both ways, and then, just for point of comparison, I also ran that same machine with both video cards installed to see how much of a difference that makes. So I've got the resu results on that. So that, that machine has 32 gig of RAM, and again, a, a NVMe SSD on that. Next, thing, next, I compared it to a couple of laptops that I have. So, probably get these mixed up. But uh, the first one is a Dell uh, 9560. This is an Intel 7, uh, i7, 7700 HQ processor, and it's running a GTX 1050 graphics card. Very similar machine. Yeah, I did get these mixed up. You get the point. So this one is a Dell 7590 XPS 15 machine. Also an i7. Um, this one has 32 gig of RAM. Well, the, the other one has 32 gig of RAM. This has 16, 16 gig of RAM. So anyway, um, yeah, so I ran tests against those machines because those are kind of in the same target market as the MacBook Pro that a lot of people would be comparing this against. Um, next one that I compared against uh, would be a MacBook Pro, an actual real Apple MacBook Pro. It's a 2019 model, 15-inch. That one has an i7 running at 2.6 gigahertz, has 16 gig of RAM. It runs uh, Radeon Pro 555X Pro, uh, GPU in that machine. And that machine was about 2200 new, and you can pick one of those up for about 1600 and Then we've got my Mac Mini, which again, it's the M1 8-core processor. It also has the 8-core GPU in it, right, 16 gig of RAM, and uh, most of the testing I did with that was actually off of a Thunderbolt drive so to give it the best performance advantage that I could. Next thing uh, that I compared was this little Intel Nook. And I, right, the reason I did this is I wanted to compare another small form factor PC, and I also wanted to include a budget machine in the mix. So this one's an i5. Uh, it's, it's a model from 2018, so it's three generations old at this point. Uh, has 8 gig of RAM and... It has an NVMe SSD, uh, no real GPU, uh, so to speak, just the built-in one part of the Intel chip. It's the UHD 620. But I wanted to see, as a point of comparison, how well a computer that costs $350, brand new today, would, uh, would do against the others. And then I also want to mention that I included my old 2012 MacBook Pro, the very first Retina machine that came out in this, in this comparison. So anybody who's running a machine that's roughly that age, uh, you get a, kind of an idea for how well the M1 performs compared to that. For informational purposes, this is the Mac Mini M1. It's a, I got the version that has 16 gig of RAM and 256 gig of SSD storage. And or anything video related, you really need 16 gig. The 8 gig model just isn't going to cut it. Uh, ideally, more 32 would be even better, especially if you're running 
something like After Effects or Apple Motion. You really need that additional memory for those products. Premiere and Resolve and Final Cut you can get by with a little bit less memory. They don't do any aggressive caching with any of the footage that you're editing. But uh, yeah, so it's always a good idea to have have more than the eight gigs that these machines come with in their base models. Uh, you really, you really need that for these 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 software applications to be able to perform well. In terms of the version of the software that I used, I started doing testing with uh, the version of uh, Adobe Premiere and After Effects that was available on February 18th, and then I updated it. I updated it recently. Uh, I left it on the same version for for the most for the majority of my testing. And then I just updated it last week and I reran some of the more tough render files to see if the newer versions perform any better and as of right now they do not. So performance in the latest beta that's uh, available in term available at the time of re I'm recording this on April what's the day, 26th. Uh, it's exactly identical to the performance that I got when I did the majority of this testing in late February. So things have not improved there. Hopefully they will improve in the future because right now the performance is just not that amazing on the M1 for doing video rendering. Um, so I also tested against uh, similar, similar projects in DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro as much as I could, but there was something lost in each one of the imports. There's no direct path from Adobe Premiere into Final Cut Pro. You have to go through something else. I use Resolve as, as my go-between between for those in order to generate. Because the XML files that Premiere creates are not compatible with Final Cut Pro 10, and so you have to go through Resolve. And each one of those steps, there's a fair amount of stuff that's lost, much more so going from Resolve to Final Cut than going from Premiere into Resolve. So as we as I compare the apps, we want might, might want to keep that in mind. So like for example, the Final Cut version of the project that I'm going to be showing you at some point, uh, it doesn't have any of the scaling, it doesn't have any of the transitions, it doesn't have any of the coloring, it doesn't have any of the After Effects uh, lower thirds that are, that are present in Adobe Premiere. So we're really asking Resolve and Final Cut to do a lot less than I asked uh, Premiere to do and as a result when you do see those performance comparisons Premiere it runs behind the others because it's having to work a lot harder uh, and unfortunately there's just no easy way to pull all that stuff over and short of recreating the entire pro cre recreating the entire project from scratch in all three that's really the best that I could do so with that caveat uh, let's actually kind of take a look at some of the performance numbers for uh, some of these projects. So I'm going to start out by showing you the actual projects themselves. So I'm going to start here. This is what I call my Shinobi render test. So I did a video a little while ago here on my channel where I tested the Shinobi SDI from Atomos and instead of using the actual project on that one I used just the raw footage. I wanted to have something that was very, very simple. This is basically a transcoding test. So how well does each one of these applications do in terms of transcoding from the ProRes footage that we start, I started out with into other formats? So for each one of the renders, and this is true across the board, I rendered into H.264, I rendered into HEVC, and I rendered into ProRes. And very quickly, let me show you some of the presets that I used for that. So in terms of H.264, I used the YouTube 2160p 4K Ultra HD preset. Uh, all the footage that I used was Ultra HD, the overwhelming majority at 29.97 frames per second. Um, two exceptions. Uh, I'll get to those. Uh, I'll talk about those when I get when I get to that particular project. But everything else was Ultra HD 29.97 frames per second. So, so uh, H.264 on the export. I used the YouTube 2160p 4K Ultra HD preset and I didn't change any other settings. So just the default setting that it came with. In terms of HEVC, uh, I used the 4K UHD preset and again, didn't make any other changes. And again, this is across the board. Both Mac and PC use the exact same settings. For ProRes, I used the QuickTime and then the ProRes 422 preset. So every one of the videos, again, used that same preset. So. And that's, that was universal not only through Premiere, uh, but also in After Effects. And then once I got to DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro, I tried to approximate the same settings in there, 
you have far less control in those apps in terms of the quality of the exports. But I tried the, the best that I could in order to replicate similar file sizes. Uh, so we're talking about roughly the same level of uh, load that's placed on the CPU and GPU. Okay, with that said, so yeah, so this one really was just um, a transcoding test. So how well does each one of the applications transcode from the original ProRes 422 footage into H.264, into HEVC, and into ProRes as well. And let's actually take a look at some of those numbers. So this is the Shinobi raw footage transcode test. Got the different computers here on the left. I talk about my, the different configurations in my other video, so I'm not going to go over that here again. But uh, yeah, so the Mac Mini M1 is right here. And then the computer that I kind of want to do the main comparison against down here is the Ryzen 5. 3600 with a 2060, it's a RTX 2060 graphics card. And so, yeah, so this is just a transcoding test. There's no effects going on here. There's no transitions, there's no scaling, nothing. So it's just it's just transcoding the footage. For this timeline, which by the way, what was, what was the length on that? Grab that real quick. So in Premiere, yeah, the length on this was, so 17 minutes, 22 seconds, and 22 frames. All right, so, so a 17-minute timeline on the at Mac M1 Mini, uh, uh, exporting as HEVC, took 10 minutes, 33 seconds. And for H.264, 11 minutes and 13 seconds. So faster than real time on that. Uh, the ProRes, on the other hand, only took a minute 50. And essentially what's happening there is that Premiere is recognizing that the input video source is identical to the output. And so instead of decoding and then re-encoding, and the time that it takes to do that and the potential loss in visual quality, it's really just copying the source footage to the destination. So that's why it looks like the ProRes renders here are so fast, because it's really just copying the data from the source drive to the destination drive. The one in every case, except one, I used SSDs and VME SSDs for the source and destination. On the Mac Mini, I used Thunderbolt 3 for the source, and then I rendered to the internal SSD uh, inside the computer. For other computers, I did something similar. The computers that actually support Thunderbolt, so my Dell laptops, I use Thunderbolt as well. This is actually a USB drive here, but I used a Thunderbolt drive with the exact same files and rendered to the internal SSDs. The one big exception to that is my Ryzen 9 3950X, which is my daily driver. I did not want to tie up that computer while I was trying to get work done, and so I rendered all these things in the background with, nothing, with, with other software running in the foreground. So I was just doing my normal daily work. And I also, also run out of, had run out of space, space on the, my NV, I'd run out of space on my NVMe SSDs. And so the raw, raw footage for those actually came off of a magnetic hard drive. So that machine was at a distinct disadvantage compared to all the rest because the, because the footage was coming from a hard drive. It was, was being rendered to an NVMe SSD, but the raw footage was coming from magnetic disks. And so, for example, on this one, you can see that, that it took a minute 58 to, to do the, the ProRes 422 render, whereas a slower computer did it in a minute and 24. And that is directly due to the fact that the footage for all of my tests on that one computer came from a hard drive as opposed to an SSD. All right, so, yes, so Mac Mini, 10 minutes, 30, 33 seconds. Compare that to 10 minutes, or 6 minutes and 29 seconds for the HEVC render on uh, this particular transcode test. The H.264, uh, there you go, 11 minutes and 13 seconds versus, versus 5 minutes and 31 seconds. So in that case, uh, it was more than twice as fast on the Ryzen 5 system uh, than it was on the Mac Mini. Again, I'm going to compare these two machines because they're roughly uh, roughly the same in price, or at least they were when, that, when I built this Ryzen 5 machine. Uh, built that machine for about $900, and $900 is what I spent on this Mac Mini. Uh, that's, that is the going rate for a machine that's been upgraded to, six, to 16 gig. So unfortunately, the prices on those 2060 cards has gotten insane. Uh, you can still pick up a computer that features one. I'll cover, cover more of that at the very, very end. Uh, they're a little bit more money than the Mac. So unfortunately, you're spending a little bit more. But in terms of performance, you're getting two to five times the performance out of that machine that you do out of the Mac Mini. You'll see that more in the numbers as we go. This was the simplest test that I ran. It was just a transcoding test, and things only got more complicated from there. So the next one I want to talk about is the Crew Access Update video. So we'll actually pull up that project here. This, again, was very, very, very simple. So this footage was mostly ProRes 422, but there was actually 
uh, some other footage that was you know, coming from an MXF, M MXF file. Uh, basically, it's XAVC uh, from these Sony cameras that I use, the PXWZ150s. So I had to drop a couple shots in there. But the overwhelming majority of this project was in ProRes 422. There's no coloring. There's uh, essentially no, very, very little scaling, um, if any. I can't remember off the top of my head if there was any. But if there is any, that's very, very minimal. So this is almost just like a transcoding test as well. Very, very little going on. There is one uh, lower third. I'm sorry, there's one, one graphic that's placed in here. I needed to blur some information on the screen, and so I, I, I did a just a still image in there for a brief period of time. But the overwhelming majority of this was ProRes 422 with the occasional MXF with uh, XABC footage inside of it. Okay, let's look at the actual render times on this. Now, oh, Mac Mini. Oh, let's get the length on the timeline. So the length on this timeline is 7 minutes, 19 seconds, and 23 frames. So just under 7 and a half minutes. Render time on the Mac Mini M1 in H into HEVC, 4 minutes, 18 seconds. Into ProRes, 1 minute, 45. Again, mostly just copying files. And then in, in H.264, it took 4 minutes and 37 seconds. So faster than real time. So not quite half, not quite half of the time, but very close. Um, so very performed very, very well for that. The performance on that was actually quite, access, uh, quite acceptable. Come down to the Ryzen 5 3600 with the 2060, and our render times are basically half of what they were on the Mac Mini. So 2 minutes, 41 seconds in HEVC. 133, again, that's mostly a copy operation on ProRes, and then 2 minutes and 13 seconds in H.264, which is literally almost exactly half of the time on the Mac Mini M1. So, yeah. Um, just in terms of comparison, Mac, MacBook Pro i7, this is a 2019 model. This is one of the higher-end models, 2.6 gigahertz i7, um, 32 gig of RAM on that machine. That did the render in 5 minutes, 8 seconds for HEVC. It took five, 9 minutes and 59 seconds on H.264. So in this case, the Mac Mini was actually considerably faster than the MacBook Pro that had an i7 processor in it. So there were, there, those two machines were trading blows quite a bit. Uh, but on average, aside from the most complicated project I put the, these devices through, uh, the, the Mac Mini M1 actually outran the, that 2019 MacBook Pro. So... Anyway, so bottom line is, in this case, the PC that I'm comparing against, the Ryzen 5 3600, about twice as fast as the M1. But the performance on the M1 was very much acceptable for this video. Not very complicated, not a whole lot of, not, not something that's going to stress the CPU or GPU, uh, but yes. Okay, all right, let's look, take a look at the next video. RTMP receiver. This is a video I released on my channel back in January. Uh, this is, a, again, fairly simple. The big difference with this one is it has a bunch of these lower thirds in there. These are actually After Effects uh, compositions. And so in order to render those, Premiere is launching the After Effects rendering engine, requesting that those frames be rendered, and then bringing that back. It's all through a technology that Adobe calls Dynamic Link. I don't... I don't have to pre-render the files, basically. So they're rendered in real time on... on the Premiere timeline. Unfortunately, After Effects is not super fast when it comes to these sort of things. So as I play this video, let me get a little closer to one of these. Uh, yeah, so I'll press the space bar here. You may notice that things get really choppy and the frame rate drops quite a bit. And I noticed that quite a bit on the M1. Every, anytime it was being asked to do anything in After Effects, performance really tanked quite a bit and got, got rather sluggish. So that's the big big issue with this. So this one has a whole bunch of these lower thirds that are that are being dropped on the timeline. But other than that, it's ProRes 422 footage almost exclusively. There's really nothing else there. So it's ProRes 422, no coloring, no scaling, no motion, no animation, no and, and none of that whatsoever. This is really, and I selected this one explicitly because it is basically just ProRes 422 with a handful of lower thirds done in After Effects. Okay, so the total time on this video is 19 minutes and 53 seconds. Let's take a look at the performance on this one. So, RTMP server video. All right, here we go. So, M1, 
rendered to HEVC in 16 minutes 48 seconds, in the ProRes 1836, and to H.264 1837. So a little bit slower than real time on this one. So that inclusion of the After Effects really slowed things down because before we were seeing faster than real time rendering performance, but throw in those handful of lower thirds using After Effects and the performance actually slowed down quite a bit. Let's compare that to the Ryzen 5 3600 with a 2060. 7 minutes 23 seconds in the HEVC, 10 minutes 49 into ProRes 422, and 6 minutes 43 into H.264. So in this case, uh, the PC is running almost three times faster than the M1 uh, for this particular timeline. So yeah, After Effects really slows down the M1 quite a bit. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that trend continue as we get into more complicated projects. All right, let's take a look at the next project. So this is a behind-the-scenes video that I posted for paying members of the channel. Uh, I, was, I was subcontracting for a volleyball tournament uh, that took place in November. I shot a behind-the-scenes video to let everybody see what was going on. So very briefly, you can see some of the crew there. Uh, this is where I'm describing how the cameras are set up. Uh, in addition to including my own behind-the-scenes video, I actually included some footage from the event itself and kind of intermix and intercut those back and forth. But again, super, super simple timeline. It's really only cutting back and forth between the two, two, two uh, sources of footage. I, I did this one because this uh, has to do, this Premiere actually has to do some processing of this video. So the timeline in this one, this is the one exception. The timeline on this one is Ultra HD at 59.94 frames per second. The behind-the-scenes footage that I shot uh, was at Ultra HD at 29.97 frames per second, so it's having to do a frame rate conversion on that. And then in terms of the actual volleyball game, this footage was 1080p at 59.97. So the frame rate was as a match, but the resolution is not. So it's having to scale this video up. So the entire, basically this entire timeline that Premiere is having to do either frame rate conversion or scaling. And so this was going to put a little bit more load on the computer than some of the alternatives. All right, this timeline is 14 minutes and 55 seconds. Let's take a look at the render times on this one. So volleyball hall behind the scenes. M1 actually did pretty well on this. Uh, it was able to, it was a little bit slower than real time. So 15 minute video rendered in 1757 for HEVC, 1835 in ProRes, 1857 in H.264. The Ryzen 5 3600 rendered in HEVC 11 minutes 59 seconds, and ProRes in 1509, and H.264 in 732. So roughly two to two and a half times faster on the PC than it was on the M1. Uh, this is one place where the MacBook Pro kind of choked a little bit going into H.264, where it took 53 minutes and 40, 45 seconds to do the, that H.264 render. The other rendering times into HEVC and ProRes were actually pretty comparable to the M1. So it's pretty impressive the M1 is able to keep up with a higher-end MacBook Pro from a little over a year ago. Um, but at the same time, it's not keeping up with the PCs, the Windows PCs that are actually doing rendering this video. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. So this next one is an episode of the Stream Team series that we had here on this channel. I did it with my friend Wit last summer. This is episode 16. I wanted to include this one because this one has a lot of cutting back and forth between ProRes and uh, XAVC footage. And it also has a LUT applied to it, and there are a handful of lower thirds and other graphics that are applied to it. So this is getting a little bit more complicated. and. So yeah, as I scrub through here, you can, you can see all the various cuts that are going on here. We, have, we had three cameras that were recording basically through the entire time. Um, and so we're, we're cutting between a program feed that was in ProRes and then isolated cameras for left and right that are in XAVC. So again, this is more complicated than the other timelines that came before it. Total, total time on this video is 20 minutes and 46 seconds. Oh, I should also mention that there is a color LUT that's applied here up at the top. And so if I toggle that, whoops, so if I toggle that on and off, you'll be able to see that it's affecting the colors on the video as well. So that's done with an adjustment layer on the top of the entire video clip. All right, so again, yeah, 20 minutes, 46 seconds. Let's take a look at the rendering times on this. So Stream Team Episode 16. 
All right, the Mac Mini M1 rendered HEVC -E in 45 minutes and 6 seconds, rendered to ProRes in 34 minutes, 32 seconds, and to H.264 in 33 minutes and 28 seconds. So about, uh, it's not quite double, but 150% but longer uh, to do the renders on this than the actual time of the video clip itself. Come down to the Ryzen 5, it did the HEVC -E render in 13 minutes, 28 seconds, ProRes in 1739, H.264 in 13 minutes and 49 seconds. So those are all, on, on that Ryzen 5 machine, those are all faster than real time. Whereas on the Mac Mini, it's 150% longer than real time. So you're looking at a ratio of a little more than two to one, about two and a half to one in terms of the rendering time between those two. So yeah, definitely we're seeing that the Mac, the M1 is really starting to get pushed pretty hard and it's not able to keep up any longer. At this point, if you're trying to play the timeline, it's getting really stuttery. It's just really not able to give you a smooth experience. Um, so I've got that at half, at half resolution. If I bring it up to full resolution, the frame rates will actually drop, especially when you get into cutting between. So yeah, you, you'll see that the, the footage just doesn't play quite as smoothly there. And you'll see that in the uh, render times where it's taking 175 percent longer in order to do the render than the actual length of the timeline itself all right that's going to bring us to the last most complicated video that i that i did for this so this is the video that i released here back in february on dante the audinate dante audio over ethernet protocol this is by far the most complicated video that i that i tested but this is by no stretch of the imagination that complicated compared to a lot of the stuff that people are doing, not just uh, uh, for television or whatever, but also even for YouTube. You find that some of these people are doing multiple layers on top of layers, on top of layers, on top of layers. This one really only has five layers, and most of them are, are mostly empty, so it, it is cutting back and forth between footage quite a bit. Now, uh, this footage is mostly ProRes 422, there, although there are a handful of situations where we cut over to an XAVC video clip, although it does not happen very often. There is a lot of scaling going on here, though. So as we go to some of these clips, you find that, for, for example, when it goes from here to here, we're jumping in, we're using a scaling effect on the clip in order to basically produce what looks like, it's supposed to look like another shot. That happens a lot through this timeline. There's also a fair, fair number of transitions that are going on, and there is a LUT, color LUT, that's being applied to this footage as well. Uh, there are a handful of lower thirds that are taking place here. Not a lot, uh, but, there, but there are some. And yeah, so there, you can see there's a lot of scaling and motion that's going on. All this motion is being done uh, by animating some of the control points uh, in, on, on the scaling and position and rotation uh, controls on the effect under the effect controls. So this video is uh, 35, 34 minutes and 25 seconds, and we'll take a look at the rendering times for this one. This one, this is probably the most revealing of anything. So let me. This is actually up at the top. So let me scroll up to that. Give it a second. There we go. So the Dante video. All right. Again, the video is 34 minutes 25 seconds. M1. Uh, to HEVC took two hours, 59 minutes, and 15 seconds. So six times longer uh, than the actual video. A little less than six times longer than the actual video. Going into ProRes, it was actually a little longer. Three hours, 10 minutes, 19 seconds. Going to H.264, two hours, 59 minutes, and four seconds. All right, compare that to the MacBook Pro i7. So one hour, 34 minutes, and four seconds into HEVC. 127.50 into ProRes and 134.32 into H.264. Compare that against the reference PC system that's roughly the same budget. The rendering time on that one into ATVC was 21 minutes 39 seconds, 2407 into ProRes and 2118 into H.264. Even more impressive, we come down here and look at my desktop computer that I do most of my work on and a lot of the editing for this channel. It was rendering that video in 14 minutes and 29 seconds into H.H.E.V.C., 1234 into ProRes, and 1148 into H.264. So in that case, that's rendering almost three times, actually more than three times faster than real time. Whereas you go up to the Mac Mini M1, and it's taking five times longer, five plus times longer than real time in order to complete that render. So the ratio between those two is, uh, what, 15 to 1, something like that. So... And even compared to the Ryzen 5 here, uh, those 
where it's rendering in a third of an hour compared to three hours. So it's a nine to one ratio on that one. So and I don't think that this timeline is actually that sophisticated. There's not that much going on. And so that's kind of why I came to the conclusion that the M1 just really can't keep up with what most people are doing with video rendering. Like a lot of the videos people create here for YouTube or even things for uh, Instagram or TikTok or whatever, you know, um, there are a lot of people are doing things that are a lot more sophisticated than this timeline. So, yeah, for that reason, I have a hard time recommending the M1 uh, processor in any model of, of Mac, whether that be the Mini or the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro or the new iMac that's just been released. It just doesn't feel like it's up to the, the challenge of editing video of any sort of sophistication whatsoever. And other testing that I did, you start dropping multiple clips on one top on top of one another, especially if you got transparency involved, the performance actually just tanks. It really starts to slow down quite a bit. It doesn't handle trans transparent clips well at all. That's really that was really the thing that I saw where it really hurt the performance the most. And yeah, it just doesn't handle that with any sort of speed or elegance whatsoever. So and that's Adobe Premiere. Uh, unfortunately, I can't duplicate these exact same timelines into DaVinci Resolve or into Final Cut Pro. I did move them over anyway. So I took all of these same, or most of these same timelines and ran tests in DaVinci Resolve. I really only found that the ones that were relevant were the Shinobi transcoding test and then this Dante video. Everything else, it scaled linearly. linearly so... So those two were pretty revealing in terms of performance uh, of, uh, of the Resolve and Final Cut Pro. So let's actually take a look at some of those numbers. All right, so Resolve rendering times. All right, so this is this is the total of the two videos, so the Shinobi and Dante video. Uh, Mac Mini M1 took 1 hour, 32 minutes, 26 seconds to render both of those timelines. Uh, MacBook Pro 135.52, so very, very similar there. Also very similar to my Dell laptops, incidentally. And then come down to, to, to that Ryzen 5 3600, which did that same timeline, series of timelines in 37.49. So in that case, two and a half times faster than the M1 at that same task. So again, Resolve is faster, but it was also being asked to do a heck of a lot less here. Uh, but there was still a, what's a three to one, roughly three to one, two and a half to one ratio between the M performance of the M1 and a, a similarly priced Windows PC. Okay, all right. Um, After Effects, or things got a little bit more interesting, and I'm going to insert the, the a copy of the footage that I actually recorded. I was not able to get it loaded on here. I ran a space on my SSDs, but it basically took uh, nine of my previous YouTube videos and put them in, into a timeline and did the rendering on that. The final video on that, I think it was about 15 or 20 seconds or something like that, not very long. And the rendering times on that were pretty revealing. I uh, found that across the board, the, most of the machines were rendering within fairly similar times. So it's like M1 rendered that clip 2 hours, 20 minutes, 12 seconds. The MacBook Pro did it 2 hours, 18 minutes, 11 seconds. Uh, my small little Intel Nook computer that I included in my test is kind of a reference point for a, a super cheap computer that you can get pick up very inexpensively, a budget machine. Uh, it did that same timeline in 2 hours, 20 minutes, 21 minutes and 49 seconds. So a machine that costs roughly the a little more than a third the price of the M1 was able to render After Effects in a similar amount of time. Uh, my Dell 7590 was actually able to do it about a third faster, but my my older XPS 9560 took longer. It's kind of interesting there. Uh, we look at our reference machine, reference PC, the AMD Ryzen 5 3600 with a 20, 2600 video card. It was able to do that render in 1 hour, 33 minutes, and 59 seconds. So about a third faster than the M1. My desktop main, main desktop PC did that same render in an hour, 4 minutes, and 33 seconds. Not surprising. After Effects is actually mostly CPU intensive. It's able to take advantage of the GPU to some degree, but it really does not really... It's not GPU bound in most situations, and so putting a new GPU in and a computer running After Effects doesn't necessarily improve performance like that much. In this case, the main thing that's happening with the 3950 is that's a 16 core chip compared to the six core and four core chips uh, that are in most of the other machines. I should mention that the Mac Mini M1 is an eight core processor, and so 
basically what that means is the per core performance on this one just isn't quite as good as most of these other ones, at least in After Effects. Uh, the, the Intel Nook uh, machine that I have here is actually a four core chip, uh, and it was uh, right on par with the performance of the M1. Uh, so a $350 computer was roughly the, performing the same as a $900 Mac Mini M1. So anyway, so yeah, After Effects was very, very interesting and it, very revealing to me that a little tiny computer was able to keep up with, with these other computers that it cost much, much, much more. Uh, but also finding that the Mac Mini M1 uh, was just not was not performing up to the speed expectations that I would have had for it, uh, having an 8-core CPU and 8-core GPU. It just uh, doesn't perform as well as I would have hoped. All right, let's take a look at um, comparison between some uh, between the different pieces of software. So this is my Dante video that I showed you a moment ago. Again, this really needs to be... I need to. I really need to emphasize this: that this is not an equal comparison between Premiere, Resolve, and Final Cut. Just because, without creating a, without creating three timelines from scratch, designed explicitly to to compare these, this is not an equal comparison. Because when I moved from Premiere into Resolve, the After Effects clips had to be pre-rendered, and so. Resolve was not having to do that after effects thing, which is really what slows these down, slows these renders down more than anything else. And then moving over into Final Cut Pro, all of the animation, all of the motion, uh, all of the coloring, that all disappeared as well. And so again, Final Cut Pro was being asked to do the very little, the very least. It was really just cutting between between clips, and that's about it. Uh, whereas in Premiere, it was having to do all the coloring and animation and uh, after effects composition and whatnot. So. That's why there's such a, a huge uh, difference in the performance between these. So anyway, Mac Mini M1, two hours fifty nine seconds and four two, two hours fifty nine minutes and four seconds in order to render the Adobe Premiere. And it was able to do the DaVinci Resolve in twenty three minutes and twenty seven seconds, and then Final Cut Pro took thirty minutes and fifteen seconds. So even though Final Cut was being asked to do the least and had the lightest load, it was actually still taking longer than Resolve. Um, Again, it's really hard to do a comparison against Premiere Pro because it was really having to work a lot harder than the others. Take a look at the AMD Ryzen 5 3600. Um, Final Cut Pro is not, not something that runs on Windows, so we really have, only have Premiere Pro and Resolve numbers. So the Premiere Pro took 21 minutes, 18 seconds, and the DaVinci Vin Vin Resolve render took 11.45. Again, Resolve was not having to do the After Effects rendering on that, so it's not really what I would call a fair comparison. Although we compare, come down here, look at the Ryzen 9 30, 3950, and the rendering time between Premiere Pro and Resolve was actually very, very close. It was only a little over 30 seconds difference between the two. And for rendering a 35-minute timeline with that complexity and having After Effects clips in their performance on that machine, well, doing that timeline in 1148 is very, very impressive. So, yes. Now let's take a look at the same thing, basically, and then rendering into HEVC. So, yeah, Mac Mini, two hours fifty nine seconds, or two hours fifty nine minutes and fifteen seconds for for Adobe Premiere Pro, and twenty one minutes forty seconds for DaVinci Resolve. Uh, Final Cut Pro does not do HEVC, so it was left out of this test. The uh, Mac Mini from twenty nineteen did the Premiere Pro render in one thirty four oh four, and the DaVinci Resolve in twenty six twelve. AMD Ryzen 5 3600, our reference PC, we did the render in 2139 in Premiere Pro and 1315 in DaVinci Resolve. So quite a bit faster on the Adobe Premiere and about a, a third faster compared to the M1 uh, in DaVinci Resolve. And I kind of saw that same, same sort of relationship for most of the stuff that I was testing where the PC was outrunning the Mac in Resolve by about 50%. All right, and then uh, basically the same thing again in ProRes. Um, Pro, Pro, uh, DaVinci Resolve on Windows cannot output ProRes, therefore there's only uh, two DaVinci Resolve numbers, and it also crashed on my original 2012 MacBook Pro, so there's no numbers on that. I, oh, I should also mention that uh, Final Cut Pro, even though there's some numbers here, it actually crashed pretty every time I ran this test. Every time I asked Final Cut Pro to, to render to ProRes, it, it, would, it would not complete the render. And so the numbers I have in there are estimates. I would 
let the render go as long as it possibly could, get the time on that, we'll get the percentage that was completed and then extrapolate out there what would have been the final render time, at least approximate. But again, it's strange, all Apple software, Final Cut Pro and uh, ProRes, but uh, yeah, those, those timelines would not complete in Final Cut Pro, so those numbers here are very much approximate. In terms of comparison between Premiere Pro, we've got the M1 taking 3 hours, 10 minutes, 19 seconds. The uh, 2019 MacBook Pro taking 1 hour, 27 minutes, 50 seconds. The Ryzen 5 3600 taking 24 minutes and 7 seconds. So a very, very wide difference between those on that render time. And then I should mention that the Ryzen 9 3950X did, was able to do that same thing in 12 minutes and 34 seconds. So vastly faster than pretty much everything else that, w that, that took place here. So... All right, um, so I think that's actually going to about do it for the numbers. I'm going to make these make this spreadsheet available for anybody who wants to really dig in. There's a lot, a lot of numbers here that are not represented in some of the charts that I've shown you. Uh, you, can, you can see a lot more of what's going on, a lot more detail. So uh, I'll make that available at djp.li slash m1 performance, and you'll be able to download that for yourself. Uh, if anybody actually wants to run these tests for their own, I would ha be happy to make that stuff available. It's a lot of footage, though. Uh, I've got a 2 terabyte SSD here, and, and that doesn't even hold all of it. Uh, I think it would probably take a 3 terabyte or 4 terabyte drive in order to hold all this footage. So if it's something you really want to do, get in touch with me, contact me, and send me a drive that will be able to hold all this footage, and then I'll make, make arrangements for you to be able to run these tests on your own. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Like, I'd also be happy to see other, anybody else who wants to run these on other configurations of computers in order to see what the relative performance on those as well. So, um, anyway, and aside from the video production, the performance on M1 is actually pretty impressive. It's, it feels very, very snappy for the most part for most applications, especially those that have been released by Apple. When you start to get into third-party applications, the performance isn't quite as good, but then again, they haven't had time to optimize for, that, for this particular chip. Um, power draw, I didn't explicitly measure it, but I noticed that this machine barely gets warm at all. There's barely any heat coming out, even when I'm doing renders. It, does, it certainly does get warmer while it's doing a video render, but it never gets hot. Uh, I don't think I ever heard the fan kick on at any point while I was doing any of this testing. This does, machine does have a fan, but either it didn't kick in or it's so quiet that I never noticed it. So uh, that's certainly a good thing. That's something you're not going to be able to say about a lot of the equivalent Windows PCs. Um, at least in the same price range, you're going to have fans on all of those. Now, w <laughs> for anybody that's doing video production, I would have a hard time recommending this. So what would actually make a lot of sense instead? So I, I did a little bit of shopping around and tried to, tried to find machines that are actually available now. Right now it's next to impossible to build your own because of poor availability and pricing of GPUs. Even uh, 2060, which uh, card was only a little over $200 a year ago, you can't get them anymore unless you're willing to spend well, close to a thousand dollars at the time I'm, re I'm recording this. The GPU market is actually absolutely insane right now, and so I would not recommend that anybody buy a GPU at this point in time. If you already have a machine that has it, great. Uh, but the alternative for anybody who really wants to run a computer that's very capable of doing video editing without spending a fortune, I found two that are actually pretty good. So there's a Lenovo Legion i5 that includes an RTX 2060 video card. It's, it typically sells for about $950, although right now it seems to be a little bit more. So pricing on that one's a little more, $1150 to $1200 at the moment. Uh, there is also the Intel Nook a Tiger Canyon that has just barely come out that includes, they have a version that includes a 2060 graphics card in it and pricing on that one is kind of in that $1,200 price range as well. But either one of those machines is going to outrun this Mac Mini by a very significant margin, particularly in Premiere Pro. So if that's your workflow, if you're a Premiere Pro user and you're thinking about getting a computer right now, targeting machines that are kind of in that range, you're going to get something that's going to outrun anything that's available on the Apple side of things. And that's really a result of the fact that Apple's been uh, in disagreement with NVIDIA for years. So back in 2013, Apple and NVIDIA parted ways, and the performance of the Mac computers for video rendering has really not been that great ever since then. Having an NVIDIA GPU means that Adobe Premiere is able to offload a huge per percentage of the operations that it's doing onto the GPU, particularly the video encoding into H.264 or H.265. 
HEVC. Uh, and it actually takes advantage of the GPU for doing some ProRes stuff as well. But being able to offload those, those tasks onto the GPU means that you're able to see rendering times that are much faster than the length of the time the length of the timeline that you're actually rendering. So again, like my 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 Dante video, 35 minute video, and these computers are rendering it in around 12 minutes. So roughly three to one margin there. So you're just not spending any time waiting around for rendering if you've got an NVIDIA GPU. So anybody who's doing video editing, if you want good performance, the only way to really get it is to build a PC that has an NVIDIA GPU in it. So that's just kind of the way things are right now. I'm sure we'll see a lot of improvement in the future with the M1, but I really think that the M1 GPU in here is roughly equivalent in performance to the NVIDIA uh, GTX 1050 that was released basically five years ago, four years ago, somewhere, somewhere in that range. And that was a low-end card in its day, and certainly anything that's come out since then is gonna be significantly faster. And unfortunately, you just don't have those options available on the Mac side right now. So anybody who's wanting to do video rendering and making it fast, you just don't have great options on uh, the Mac computers at this point in time. So anyway, I think that's going to do it. Uh, a lot of rambling, a lot of data, uh, a lot of information here. But I, I think based on all this data that I've collected that a Mac, Mac Mini M1 is fine for anybody who's doing very very simple video tasks but for anybody who's doing anything beyond a simple one track timeline in 4k in, in, in 1080p uh, that you're really going to want something that's going to be a little bit faster in order to make sure that you're getting the performance that you're you're wanting especially you know scrubbing scrubbing's okay but like if you want to be able to see your timeline playback in real time without dropping frames you really need a machine that's more powerful than what this m1 is so anyway Okay, uh, if you have any questions or comments about this, you can certainly leave those in the comment section below this video. Although at this point, we'd really prefer that you come join us over on Discord. You can find us over at djp.li slash Discord. There's a whole bunch of us, several hundred people on there that are, uh, that are out there talking about video production. And it's a very helpful community. A lot of people are willing to answer questions. Not just me. There's a bunch of other people that are ans they're answering questions as well. So reach out to us on Discord. I'm going to do a channel there on Discord specifically about the M1s and their performance. So join us there. I would ask that if you're going to comment on either this video or on discord that you be courteous to other people i know that this the m1 processors have been very divisive there's been a lot of people that think it's the best thing that's ever happened and then there's a bunch of people that think it's that there's nothing special about it and so please be courteous to one another the truth really lies somewhere in between um you know it's great for certain things but there's other things it's not that great at uh, but just please be respectful to one another we all have different experiences we all have different needs we all have different opinions on things and everybody's opinion is valid and so we need to acknowledge that and make sure that we're being courteous to one another so that's very much appreciated anybody who's not willing to to live by that is going to find themselves having their comments deleted and or be banned from from either the youtube channel or the discord server as well so anyway that's going to do it for now so thanks everyone for watching and have a fantastic day